Welcome to the University of Toronto Joint Centre for Bioethics Seminar Series. I'm Andrea Bianchi and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Our speakers today are Claudia Barnett and Kevin Rodriguez and their seminar is entitled The Sound of Silence, Bioethics and Race in Canada. Before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to let you know that the seminar is being recorded. This lecture, along with other archived lectures, can be accessed through the Joint Centre for Bioethics website. The format of our seminar is a presentation by our speakers, followed by a facilitated discussion period. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. We also stand in solidarity with the ongoing protests against racism and systemic discrimination. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Claudia Barnett is a bioethicist with the University Health Network. She provides clinical and organizational ethics support to Toronto Western Hospital, while also actively contributing towards a partnership aimed at bridging bioethics with diversity, equity, and mediation work. With advanced training in social psychology and health ethics, Claudia's research has attended to issues at the intersection of psychology and ethics. Her research program has covered topics such as cultural, con cultural constructions of health and beauty, lived experiences of illness, children's participation in research, and voluntary decision-making within the context of addiction. Presently, her research focuses on intersectionality and healthcare ethics, with an emphasis on race and gender justice in healthcare. Her work takes up a decolonial approach to inquiry and focuses on core themes such as equity, social justice, and advocacy with attention to race and race relations. Kevin Rodriguez is a bioethicist with the University Health Network. He currently provides ethics services at Toronto General Hospital and Women's College Hospital. Kevin came into bioethics after working as a spiritual care provider at St. Michael's Hospital, and his academic background is in theological ethics. Kevin is strongly committed to and works most closely in areas of health equity and social justice. Claudia and Kevin, I'll leave it to you. Thanks so much for the introduction, Andrea, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, Kevin and I, this afternoon, will be exploring the sound of silence, bioethics and race in Canada. What are we doing? What should we be doing? What needs to be done? So to provide some context for our talk, we believe that this is a topic that has not been given the attention it deserves. And it has only recently been taken up given the atrocities that this year has produced. So it's a much needed long overdue discussion. Um, and we're hoping that what we present today both challenges the status quo and stimulates further discussion. That being said, we also want to acknowledge that some of what we some of what we will say today might cause some discomfort for some, but this isn't our intention. We're merely trying to speak to an issue that needs to be acknowledged in an attempt to bolster things. So here is what we have in store for you today. We'll start off by spending some time deconstructing the notion of bioethical silence within the context of the Canadian healthcare system and Canadian bioethics. We'll be drawing on the current sociopolitical climate to decontextualize um, the silence that we're experiencing while also situating the concept within a history of inaction and exclusion of diverse voices and perspectives. We will address how race has been othered within Canadian bioethics and describe the conversations that are taking place outside of Canada. We'll then describe the dominant criticisms of the field and tease apart how professionalism or professionalization might help or hinder efforts. We'll then wrap up with what is needed for us to talk about Canadian bioethics for a just society. Okay, so I think it, it would help us to pause and, and think about 
uh, the context within which we speak. So um, our talk is grounded and, and really looking at, at silence within Canadian bioethics. Um, so what is that? What differentiates us from, let's say, uh, bioethics and our colleagues in America or globally? What is our identity built on? These are questions that, that we need to keep in mind as we go forward with this. Um, but the story of Canada is one um, that, that, that is, is complex. Um, you know, I grew up in a Canada where I, I, I was born here and had no education or exposure to residential schools, which existed, you know, up until I was in high school. Um, so you might have heard a lot throughout this pandemic that there are two different Canadas, um, one that, that's experienced by dominant groups and, and one that, that's experienced by BIPOC members. So in members of uh, Black communities, Indigenous people of colour. Um, and, and, you know, we often... Um, situate ourselves or compare ourselves uh, on the topic of race uh, against the, the United States. And, you know, we, we've just come out of four years of, of a Trump presidency where these issues were at the forefront. Um, however, what we're, what we're going to look at today and what you'll see is that um, we don't think that uh, racism does not exist in Canada. I, I'm, pro I'm probably sure that those of you watching this would agree with us on this. Um, and one only needs to look, uh, even within the GTA context, at the map of where COVID is distributed and look at what, what neighborhoods are lit up, what communities are, are most heavily burdened um, by, by this pandemic uh, to, to see that race, racism, structural racism is certainly a thing within Canada. Um, and given that Canadian bioethics is, the, is, is grounded in, in a practice that, that is serving the Canadian context, we think that these issues are, are relevant to this context as well. So much like in the States, the way in which our healthcare system is experienced by racialized or BIPOC individuals speaks to a shared distrust. It speaks to shared frustrations and lived realities of these groups. So what's important to highlight here is the intersection of race and healthcare and how discourses of egalitarianism are dominant in these settings. Discourses of egalitarianism in the hospital context paints a, per a perspective of healthcare institutions as discrimination free and reinforces a widespread rhetoric that everyone is treated the same. But as practicing healthcare ethicists, we know that this isn't the case. We know that there are communities that would rather stay away from seeking care than open the doors of any hospital building. And so the sameness that's implied in these discourses asserts that racialized patients receive equally good care. And so I think one of the points that we want to drive home today is that when some racialized people attempt to navigate healthcare, the way that they physically present, the way that their bodies are read and interpreted, one's black physicality, one's indigenous identity, these markers trigger a differential experience of the system. And so while egalitarian discourses in theory might be admirable for what they hope to, to achieve, in practice, they ignore the fact that people have diverse life experiences and therefore have differing abilities to negotiate power relations and the hierarchical structures that are inherently characteristic of clinical settings. So uptake of and reproduction of these discourses can play a powerful role in masking structural inequities. And so, what we want to highlight is that despite these discourses, we know that race matters in healthcare. And we know that people are not treated equally. We know that racialized people are likely to experience bias and profiling. And so we don't have to look too far to get at what those experiences are. If we reflect on what happened to Brian Sinclair in 2008 and what killed Joyce Eshakan two months ago, the answer is a six letter word, racism. Brian Sinclair, pictured top left, was a 45 year old indigenous man who was ignored to death. He died waiting to be seen in the emergency room in Winnipeg's Health Sciences Center. And they realized he was dead 34 hours after he arrived. Joyce Eshakan was a 37 year old indigenous woman pictured to the right of Brian Sinclair also pictured with her husband, um, was subjected to racist taunts and abuse, degrading and dehumanizing comments amidst cries for help during her stay at Joliet Hospital in Quebec. 
and Joyce live streamed the hatred and racism that she was subjected to in her final moments of life. So what we're trying to highlight here is that racialized people have very different experiences of the healthcare system. If we take particular experiences of certain populations, so if we, if we think about how for some groups anti-Black racism is at work, if we, if we examine the experiences of patients with sickle cell disease, for example. So sickle cell is a blood disorder that is more common among people of African descent. And there is a common theme around horrendous emergency department experiences when in crisis. So a major symptom of sickle cell anemia is periodic episodes of pain when in crisis. And the response that these patients are often met with revolves around not receiving pain medication, not being believed, not, sorry, not being believed, being labeled as drug seekers, being called frequent, fly, frequent flyers of the, of the healthcare system. And then an additional layer of this is that they have to worry about how they present. So while in debilitating pain, there's an additional worry about changing out of sweatpants and a hoodie in fear of being labeled or having one's attire influence the type of care that one receives. And so I ask today, what are the subtle and overt messages that this sends about how we view body of color, bodies of color? Um, and this is just one of the many different experiences that make up people's lived realities. So despite these well-known themes, there are issues, these aren't issues that we examine in any depth within Canadian bioethics, but rather we interact with them on the fringe without much deeper analysis or unified engagement. So these aren't topics that the Canadian bioethics community has historically addressed in any depth or with any significance. Kevin, I don't know if you wanted to jump in here. Yeah, thanks, Claudia. Yeah, I, I think to that point, uh, we, we can ask and pause here to, to ask, where is the bioethics voice for the story of, of Brian Sinclair or Joyce Echequan? No, we, there have been some recent articles. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and we'll talk about what we mean by silence in the future. But when you think about this, uh, these are some examples that, that rose to the media attention. There, there are some extreme examples. There are many more like this um, and, and they exist in, in different ways. Take for example, what I mentioned about the Canadian context and, and the map of COVID lighting up in certain communities. Look at, at Peel region and Brampton, for example, um, where South Asian communities, uh, Southeast Asian communities have been significantly hit by Brampton. And in the, in the vacuum, within which bioethics could have occupied and perhaps commented on structural racism, um, others are jumping in. And uh, in, in fact, there was an article in the National Post by a group of ID physicians, I believe, um, of South Asian descent um, that wrote sweeping generalizations about how um, this is in part bolstered up by South Asian culture. There were, there were generaliz generalizations rather about culture um, and, and, and talk about the agency that these groups need to take in preventing pandemic. And you no, know, th there, there certainly is some value in, in some uh, of, of, of what was said in the article. However, um, nowhere did it touch on structural racism as, as part of the picture here. Um, and that's something that we will argue is a role that bioethics ought to serve. The other piece um, around Joyce Echequan uh, and, and Brian Sinclair, the indigenous experiences are, 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 are are not always as overt like this. There are other insidious ways that our spaces in hospitals are not safe ones for, for um, BIPOC, uh, BIPOC members. Um, for example, uh, as, as Andrea mentioned, my, my um, background is in theological ethics. Uh, so what, what, is, what is of concern to me is um, in, 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 that, that there's, a, there's a unique faith-based aspect here as well. This exists in, in all hospital spaces um, but as we move to reconciliation, um, in, in faith-based hospitals, uh, in, in many hospital rooms, there are symbols, religious symbols that exist in, in uh, patient room spaces. And as we move towards um, a reconciliation, one has to ask, is, is access equitable, safe, and free from trauma if we have symbols that serve to re-traumatize a large portion of, of our, our patient population, such as crucifixes in, in patients' rooms, uh, patients that might have had an experience of residential school or been uh, second generation survivors of that. These are areas that I think ethics ought to occupy and speak to, um, but largely we have seen a, a bit of a void uh, you know, for these discussions. 
Thanks, Kevin. Um, so we need to think about these experiences within the context of the larger system. So who makes up the system? We need to reflect on our own positionalities, how we are complicit in this system and how our responses or lack thereof works to perpetuate and reproduce harms. So at this point, we ask you to take a moment and reflect on your social location within this system. While I read to you the words of Dr. Pascal Bro, a family physician who serves the Manawan First Nations community in Quebec. Since Joyce's death, I have been remembering dozens of conversations with patients and families at the Manawan dispensary who begged me, who negotiated not to be sent down to Joliet for fear of the care of the reception, of not being understood, of not being heard, of being denigrated, to live with racism again. And I always reassured and explained. Sometimes I would simply say that I had no choice, but, some, but so many other times I would offer a justification, probably a, mis a misunderstanding, the nurse meant this, the doctor must have meant that. Don't you think the attendant was simply overwhelmed? In short, I was giving them my version, my narrative of what their story was. I told them that I know the people in Joliet, that they are my colleagues, that they are good, and that they would take care of them. I think no less of them today, but I am shaken. I am shaken because I feel like someone who didn't believe the victims. Because racism, before it becomes a system, is made up of little links that become stronger than the sum of their parts. I am shaken because racism, whether individual or systemic, is perpetuated and perpetrated by someone I know. And that person looks like me. And it all started a long time ago. So Pascal's words get at the crooks of what we're hoping to highlight today, or one of the main points, which is the system is me too. So if we stop to reflect on these words and ask ourselves as bioethicists, and as a, as a wider bioethics community, how are we involved in this system? How are we implicated in this? Let's stop and reflect on what we have done to build trust among indigenous communities. Can we confidently say that we have done anything that shows that we are listening, that shows that we are attuned to the violent structures, practices and policies that are in play? Now or throughout history, what is our answer to that question? What are our reflections as bioethicists? We are the ones that also need to be doing this type of reflection. So the system is me too. We are not absolved of anything on the basis of saying that, we're, that we attend to issues of equity and justice because we do not engage with these themes of race or wider sociocultural issues. We dance around it. And so in asking this broader question, have we cultivated the types of relationships with different communities in a way that people feel safe sharing these stories with us? It comes across, ooh, wasn't done yet. <laughs> it comes across that there's a lack of introspection in what has been done in the Canadian, in Canadian bioethics. So in talking about the system, we need to talk about the structures that exist outside the walls of the hospital. And this includes mental health wellness checks. There is a very clear relationship between wellness checks and violent death for racialized people. For some, this image that you're seeing on the screen right now represents what engagement with the system can look like. But yet the attention to these issues within the, bio within the bioethics community is almost non-existent. So we, we denounce medical injustice in certain contexts, but not in others. And so what we're trying to drive home today is that people don't live their lives in a vacuum. So denouncing medical injustice shouldn't stop at the door of the hospital or the health center. And just to, to build on Claudia's point here um, and, and tie it back to the idea of two candidates, um, in the span of a day, um, there was a, a barbecue that that um, that defied quarantine orders and was allowed to to stay open in in Etobicoke. Uh, police came and and left. Um, the, no one was charged. Uh, the, there was no confrontation. Nothing. Uh, within the same day in Hamilton, um, a group of black people that were leaving an encamp an encampment space were followed by police, pulled over, 
and and carted. They were they were checked, um, and the, the, to the bafflement of the officer, uh, the people were terrified and recorded uh, the interaction. So it, it just goes to show um, exactly what Claudia is saying that that these are issues of, of health. There are issues issues of concern that we ought to take up. So we would just like to take a moment right now to reflect on the experience of those who lost their lives on account of the violent structures in place, recognizing that these are a few of many. So from left to right, top to bottom, we have Chantel Moore, Ijaz Chowdhury, DeAndre Campbell, Regis Korczynski Paquet, Rodney Levy, Machuar Madut, Jacksonal Singh Lail, Pierre Coriolan, Andrew Loku, and Tony Du. Each person, each name, each face represented here was on the receiving end of the vicious cycle described prior. So living with mental illness, police engagement through wellness checks, death. But once again, we ask, where is the ethical outrage surrounding this, this issue? Where is the flurry of activity related to the medical and social injustice experienced here? Where is the wider bioethics community? So in seeing these patterns and identifying these injustices, we've begun to ask, historically, how has the bioethics community dealt with issues of race? What has the response been throughout the years? If we think about this question within the Canadian context and we ask ourselves, how have bioethicists contributed to the lives of indigenous people, to the lives of black people, to the lives of people of color? How have we contributed to the very clear statements of hospitals being unsafe, of being treated as other and of being treated as abject? I just want to note here that that pause was a deliberate pause of silence to reflect bioethical silence. So I also want to spend some time talking about the bioethics community within the pandemic and what we've seen taken place. So we've spent a good deal of time talking extensively about substantive values, procedural values, um, we talk about these values within the context of the frameworks that we create. We talk about these values in the context of the guidelines and the protocols that we develop. So we talk about, you know, procedural values like transparency and trust and accountability. But if we take a closer look at how we practice and what we teach, we can speak to none of those values regarding bioethical silence and race. So all of this to say is that there are some issues in bioethics that are considered fundamental and inherently worthy of ethical inquiry, attention, and outrage, worthy of our time or funding focus or teaching focus and or personal research. Yet there are other topics that are more or less afterthoughts in how, we, in how they're taken up, in how they are examined, when they are considered appropriate to explore, the level of depth, the level of depth of exploration, how much within or out of scope it might be, and whether it constitutes advocacy or activism. And so race, broadly construed, is one of these issues, race and wider socio sociocultural issues. But the way we the way in which we examine race within bioethics is as other, meaning that we talk about race as an additional variable to be considered in a broader in broader analysis. So we might talk about race, how race is implicated in resource allocation or in visit, visitor restrictions or in limitations and, and, and general restrictions that are imposed. We might focus on race in AI, but it's never the focus in and of itself. We're, we don't pay attention to, the, to race within the larger structure. And so we talk about race as almost like a garnish that we sprinkle onto a meal or we sprinkle onto a cake. It, it seems as if we're blinded to these larger sociocultural issues 
and only focus on race as a subset. And so it's, it's, it's surface level engagement and not deep exploration of the issues. And so the implications of this is that not engaging with race in this way or at all perpetuates the silence that has become a characteristic feature of bioethics. This is you, Kevin. Sorry, just fumbling with the mute. Um, yeah, so so some of the things that that um, that I think we wrestle with that, that we hear um, and that some of us cringe over is the, the amount of deliberation that it takes to decide whether or not this is a topic that is worthy of bioethical analysis. So, you know, the questions that, that ask, oh, I'm on, okay, I'm unmuted, sorry. Um, questions like, is this within our scope? What makes this a bioethical issue? What is the bioethical issue here? Um, what about all the other social ills in the world? Um, you know, so we have to ask ourselves then, why are things in the way that they are? In, and a, a few slides later, we'll, we'll talk about our thoughts ab about this. Um, but I think it, it's important uh, to, to note, as Claudia has said, that we, we have not seen this pause for deliberation for other topics. Um, so, you know, in, in, in the, the recent past, um, we were rushing to have a bioethics voice and we still, we still are involved in this in medical assistance in dying. Um, there are members of our community that are doing all sorts of things um, and, and uh, we haven't necessarily questioned what the ethics scope is with that issue. Um, it hasn't paralyzed us to, to act. Um, we could look at AI, we could look at issues of genetics um, and, and we haven't seen the same pause, the same inaction um, we, we again will discuss our thoughts around this, but I think it, it, it's worth seeing this. Um, and in the pandemic context, we have had a rush um, to service many different tables uh, in the pandemics, wh whether it's, we're talking about something like triage, whether we're talking about ramping up of services, ramping down of services in hospitals, priority setting, resource allocation. These are things that, that we have, we have st stood for attention, uh, stood, stood at attention for. Um, and, and stepped up and, and, and supported our communities. And we're not saying that we shouldn't be doing these things. We're asking, where is this, um, where, where, where is this fervor for this issue? Okay, so coming back to bioethics as a value-based discipline where values such as equity, respect for life, respect for persons, justice, are held in high esteem, we're asking, as Kevin just said, where is the balance in how, in how much of our focus is expended on particular topics? So in terms of meaningful, unified engagement from the Canadian bioethics community, I don't think we can fairly say that we've paid sufficient attention to these issues. So, there, so the values and actions don't seem aligned. So it, it, it comes across as, there being a disconnect between what we say we hold in esteem versus what our practices look like. And furthermore, if we take a closer look at the prevailing values, whose values are we privileging here? What type of inquiry and ways of knowing are we advancing? And what do we know about the values of the communities that we serve and how are they represented, if at all? So the implications of these questions that I'm asking here or that we are asking here are driven home in this quote by Lee Turner. I wish to make a more general point that is directed at bioethics as a field rather than toward individual scholars. Bioethics, if it is to remain significant, if it is to, if it is to withstand the criticisms of anthropologists sociologists and social activists who see it as obsessed with the concerns of middle-class, relatively wealthy, sometimes rather narcissistic individuals, needs to remain attentive to broader social issues connected to poverty, social inequalities, lack of access to healthcare, the collapse of communities and social infrastructures and public health. So at this point, I think we're gonna, we're gonna pause and, and think again as well uh, here to ask the question, how are we different? Um, 
So I'm as Claudia was speaking, I'm I'm seeing things pop in through social media, and I'll address it in a second when when we're talking about what it what it, what do we mean when we talk about silence? But um, you know, what what I'll say at this point is that bioethics silence doesn't mean that no one is speaking about anything. So in the U.S., uh, the ASBH Code of Ethics, in fact, it it, it does incorporate something. Um, around promoting just healthcare within healthcare ethics consultation. Um, and, and specifically, it talks about uh, the duty of healthcare professionals to reduce disparities, discrimination, and inequities um, when providing consultation. So, you know, our, our American colleagues have, have perhaps moved the ball a bit further down the road than, than we have um, in Canada. Uh, and what I will say at this point as well is that, that we we are undergoing efforts in Canada. Um, you know, th th there are pockets of, of work and activity that, that, that is taking place. Um, part of what we're doing is asking what direction are, are these activities moving towards? Um, what is the reason? While, while I don't think we want to take a position to be cynical about motives uh, uh, about any of this, um, we do have to ask the question about whether the efforts that we currently see will be sustained. And, and I think we also have to ask um, as we look at the publications that do exist, why are they largely coming from the US context? Why, why are we seeing this? Why do we see that race-based data is collected much more full, in a much more fulsome way um, than it is in Canada if it's collected at all? Um, why, why are we seeing that we, we have a bit of a void and vacuum in the Canadian context with responding to these issues? Um, and, and Claudia and I were talking about this and, and we feel that in, in some ways we've been opportunistic in, in how we are influenced by and how we align with American bioethics. Um, so we rightly, I believe, um, and our director has written a paper about this, that the ASBH code of ethics has been influential around, uh, for bioethics, uh, bioethics period, not just American bioethics. But I don't think that we can be absolved of the silence that, that our community has shown to this issue by association with American bioethics. We can't jump in to rely on what, what our American colleagues have done when, it's, when it suits us and, uh, and then not commit to the work and uh, uh, finding a way to do this in a Canadian context. And as, as I think we've hopefully argued, there is a Canadian context for this work that warrants a Canadian response. Um, so, you know, the, the ASBH has also, um, I believe in their most recent uh, statement on this talk specifically about police violence and black injustice in America. Um, we haven't seen that in, in the Canadian context from our community. What we will push this towards though is, are those efforts even enough, right? Um, th the question that, that we wanna push us towards is, is it enough to acknowledge that these issues are worthy of, bioethical, of a bioethics lens? If we don't turn that lens inwards, if we're not introspective and talk about how the role, uh, uh, what the role of racism, structural racism, is and what it, how, it, how it plays out within our profession, within the way we teach ethicists, bring them up, hire them, within the way we practice in our organizations, right? Uh, so we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So in opposition to the lack of attention to sociocultural issues in bioethics, groups have begun forging paths towards a more diverse and inclusive bioethics. So black bioethics is one such path, Dr. Keisha Ray describes the term black bioethics as a rebellion against mainstream bioethics and its narrow focus. So she describes it as the application of all that we do in bioethics to issues in the black community. And so this type of rebellion also exists for the Latinx community through the creation of Latinx bioethics. So these different streams were born out of frustration at the current climate, the current culture in bioethics and the need for attention to wider social justice issues. So what are some of the dominant criticisms that, that, um, that are out there in the literature? And, and, and I'll, 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 I'll have us note that the first article that I'm gonna read through was written in 1991. So this, this is before um, we began to have a significant debate and back and forth, a polarized one around professionalization uh, in our field. But this is in 1991, Dula notes that the mainstream literature rarely includes discussion of race, class, and gender without representation, uh, without representation by every sector of society, the powerful and powerless alike, 
The discipline of bioethics is missing the opportunity to be enriched by the inclusion of a broader range of perspectives. So, you know, f fast forward, my math is going to be off here, but what, 19 years, 19 plus years, can we say that we have moved towards greater inclusion in a, in a significant way, right? Um, you know, maybe one could argue that, that Claudia and I giving this talk is, is an advancement in, in some ways. I don't know that we want to take on the weight of that, but, um, but we have to ask that question. That, that, that was 1991. Um, so in, 20, in 2003, uh, Miser critiques American bioethics, noting that we have in, inadequately noticed and questioned the dominance and normativity of whiteness in the cultural construction of bioethics. Burton argues that bioethics cannot figure out what to do with race until it understands the historical, cultural, and religious basis for current race relations. Hoberman then argues that, that uh, notes that bioethicists have not embraced the opportunity to create a, sociological, a sociologically and historically informed bioethics that might be applied to the lives of Black Americans and, and their unending health crises. So there are, there are many more. There are many more articles that, that, uh, that we encountered while doing this. Um, th there's lived experience that we could speak to as well around the criticisms. And our goal here uh, is, is in this, uh, you, and what you'll note in some of these quotes is the spirit of this is to talk about the opportunity that we are missing with this silence. It's not to hit us with a sledgehammer. It's not to, to be provocative and, and go nowhere with it. It's not to shake this profession. We, we acknowledge that we are part of this profession as well. Um, you know, and I've been in this for, for about over 10 years perhaps now. Um, so, you know, our, our goal is to look at how we can have a fundamental shift and we'll get to that in a second. Farmer and Campos though, they, they assert that, that one gets the sense that in, in attending ethics rounds and reading the now copious ethics literature, that these have nots are an embarrassment to the ethicists for the problems of poverty and racism and lack of national health insurance figure far too rarely in the literature dominated by seemingly endless discussions of brain death, organ transplantation, dot, dot, dot. Let's add AI to that. Let's add pandemic ethics to that. Let's add um, medical assistance in dying. There, there are many other issues that have rose to the surface of our attention um, and, and that, 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 haven't, uh, that, that, have, that have displaced this conversation of race that has existed you know, well before that 1991 article pointed it out. So I'll, I'll look at this quote as well, which I think really sort of drives home the point of the criticism, but I'm gonna read it. I, I bear with me as I read through this. Um, it is not simply a matter of, of applying bioethical analysis to the problems of marginalized people to help them out or to be more fair. Rather, it's a matter of making bioethics more generally universal in its scope by gathering more perspectives, gathering more perspectives, not merely as a collection of in, incommensurable experiences, but as a means of obtaining a more comprehensive and more just view of the world. It is a matter of recognizing real deficiencies in current bioethical knowledge and correcting these deficiencies in order to develop better practices for everybody, including those privileged persons who most closely approximate the rational autonomous individual at, at, at which much of bioethics thus far has been aimed. We must go beyond simply adding some attention to the problems lying at the margins of bioethics. We must look at from the margins of bioethics towards the center in order to critique and ultimately to displace that center in favor of something more expansive, more responsible, more responsive, and much more flexible in terms of its worldview. So where is this conversation in Canada? I love this, this icon that, that Claudia has put here. It's one that we're, we're all too familiar with in, in this time of, of pandemic. Um, so, so where is the conversation in Canada? So as I mentioned, you know, things are, are coming in in Twitter and, and, and uh, we'll, we'll have hopefully some time to, 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 to you know, hear from you as well and, and hear your thoughts and comments. We in no way are saying when we talk about silence that there are no voices speaking about this. Claudia and I are here today because we have the support of, of, of our director at, at UHN. Um, we're here because we were given a platform uh, at the JCB we have been supported. People have reached out to us. We have, we have allies that, that are working in this work. There are people that are doing work. There's, there, there are programs that are, are doing work as well. The question is, is it enough? And um, when we look at the Canadian context, do we have a unifying feature somewhat like the, the ASBH? Um, there, are, there are organizations, there are pockets um, of support that we could look to, but the conversation in Canada uh, is one in which I don't know that we have a unified voice. There are people 
um, that are speaking out about this, but how do we foster those voices? How do we sustain what we're saying? What is then bioethic silence? So I threw in, in this graphic here, um, so it, it, I, I just kind of Googled, you know, a tree falling in the forest because I wanted to use that, that, that idea. Those voices are somewhat like a tree falling in the forest. There are people that are speaking out. That are, there are people that, 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 that are writing very powerful writing. I, I think um, in impact ethics re, uh, fairly recently, there was an issue around um, or, or a, a topic around um, allocation of vaccines and how race should play uh, a factor in this. So yes, we, we have a uh, conversation going on, but if it's not done in a climate that has fundamentally shifted to accept that this is an issue that is worthy of bioethics attention, and it is not one in which we have turned the gaze inward to say that we are part of the problem in some ways, um, we are part of this picture of structural racism, then it's merely a tree falling in the forest. It is not going to receive the uptake that, that we, we want. Uh, this time, um, you know, post death of George Floyd, where there is a spotlight on this for some, you know, that, that spotlight exists there for, for others for, for long before that. But where, the, where, where there's momentum, that momentum will come and go, and we will not have a sustained path if we don't do uh, if we don't acknowledge this silence. And so, what is the silence? In, in part, it's about limited conversation. We don't have very many spaces that 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 um, that we can speak about this. Um, to to my knowledge, and and again, this is not a knock on anything, but to my knowledge, it's also not to to, to vault Claudia and I up here. We're not pioneers in this. Um, you know, we're not forging this work. There are others that we're relying on here, but I don't believe that there has been a talk in this sort of a venue about this topic. So, that, you know, and, and where the voices exist, I don't know that they're unified across Canada. Um, there have been a lack of safe spaces to speak about this issue, even within the groups that that we otherwise might consider safe. Um, and, and, you know, my, my BIPOC colleagues um, I think I'm not speaking out of turn to suggest that that, that that might resonate with you. There are moments that we're in so-called safe spaces where we cringe, where we don't feel safe to speak up. And when we do, we feel that it is draining. It has taken all it takes to say something simple that is a self-evident truth to some of us. There's been insufficient action. There's been action, but is it enough? We, we don't think so. If we look at how we teach people coming up in bioethics, people that, that, that are training um, to, to either incorporate bioethics into their work or that are training in fellowship programs, for example, to become bioethics. Like Claudia said, um, you know, the metaphor of adding seasoning uh, to the mix is not the one that we need. We need to think about what voices are not a part of our pedagogy. Because right now, at best, I would argue, we're sprinkling, sprinkling a little bit of um, sprinkles on top of a cake. And if that cake is tasting pretty bad, the sprinkles aren't going to do anything. Um, we could also look at, at professional diversity. Who, it is, who is it that, that, that we are attracting into bioethics? Who is currently in the field of bioethics? Uh, we're, we're not all that diverse. We do have some diversity. There are some teams that look and, and are you know, diverse in terms of gender, in terms of race. But a question that we could ask is, how do we support that diversity to speak their unique voices um, in situations where, as we're arguing, there may not be so, uh, safe spaces for that to occur. Professionalism. This is a big, big topic, um, and I, I, I'm not going to be uh, talkative issues here, but let, let's just say that without having a professional uh, a body, um, we, we perhaps lack something that, that um, you know, Claudia and I and one of our, our, our colleagues have talked about a lot, what is the mission of bioethics? What is it that we do? What is it that we're oriented towards? What are, what are our goals in bioethics? You know, there's a large literature around professionalism and, um, you know, serving to, to weed out the bad actors or to entrench power or to, 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 um, to exclude voices. And that, that could be the negative, um, you know, the negative side of professionalism. It is a double-edged sword in some ways. How we go about professionalism is fundamental. We are arguing that it's something that, that is needed and it needs to be done that is inclusive of, of different voices. It needs to be done in a way that avoids the literature that has largely led the way so far, which is a colonial literature on professionalism. Uh, professionalism is also not a magic bullet, right? Um, for example, medicine has been professionalized and there is a large discourse around the role of advocacy in medicine, but there has been space for physicians to speak out um, and they could turn to professional values. We don't have, outside of the ASBH, 
very well known, publicly accessible, and uh, publicly vetted, honestly, core values or, or mission. So I'm, I'm seeing things flash up. We're, we're at about 15 minutes left. Um, but let's also talk about this. Is it a professional obligation to speak out about these issues? So the quote from Hoberman, might one argue that bioethicists had a professional obligation to do better in this regard than the vast majority of whites, including white physicians, who do not regard racial justice as an urgent problem requiring corrective action. So th there is diversity in, in how physicians have approached this, but the point is taken. Um, I I'll push at this and say, can we have a professional obligation if we do not belong to a profession, right? Um, and again, the, the discourse on this, there are some valuable points that even our, our most provocative commenters around professionalization have raised that serve to, to, to be a beacon for us. Professionalization does include potential exclusion of voices if we don't do it right. It also, um, it, it, it could be done for the wrong motives. It could be around entrenching of, of power. So we need to, we're, we're arguing that it doesn't need to be that way. Professionalism and the march towards professionalization can include diverse voices. In fact, it ought if, if this is something we need to be taking up in, in bioethics. The ASBH, has commented that, that it is a professional obligation to look at discrimination and inequity, but the step needs to, to go further than what we consider to be a professional obligation. It also needs to be that we have an obligation to look at this within our community and to root it out and dismantle the structures of, of racism that exist among us as well. So if you look at what we need in bioethics, this is perhaps, we, we had this on an earlier slide and, um, we talked about it and, and, and largely concluded that this is perhaps an aspirational diagram, that bioethics, um, you know, as, as we would like it, would have an intersection here with racism. It has an intersection with healthcare access and delivery. And where we want to operate and look at um, is it, uh, why we're not operating in this space is that purple star where there's an intersection, acknowledging that there is an intersection, there's a relevance to engage that intersection. Um, that, that this is maybe an aspirational diagram where we could say, let's work within that purple star. However, what I think this off, how I think this diagram often plays out, or at least this is what it feels like, is that bioethic circle is actually like a balloon. It's floating in the air, not connected to racism, not necessarily collect, uh, connected to that intersection between racism and healthcare access and delivery. Uh, it's a balloon that pops into the picture when it needs to, and it floats back out. Um, and one can only be part of this picture if, if, if as a field, we become introspective, we become self-reflective on how these structures are impacting all levels um, of, of, of bioethics education, practice, professionalism, uh, sorry, professionalization as well. Um, so I know that we're running close to time, um, but I, I thanks, Andrea is gonna pop in and give me my reminder, I think. Um, but, and I'm going to be wrapping up soon, Andrea, so I, I, I thank you for that, for the reminder um, that you're about to give. Um, but, but what does a fundamental shift look like in, in bioethics when we're looking at this idea of, of, of our engagement and our role um, uh, to, to look at racism? So we think, and, and, and we talked about this along the way, that it involves a meaningful move towards professionalization. Meaningful meaning that it, it can't follow the path that, um, that, 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 that looks at excluding others. It's not about entrenching power, about staking out our territory. Certainly, we need to talk about scope, but scope doesn't mean carving out your territory and space. Now, I was having a conversation with my spouse about this, um, just asking her about what she thinks about professionalism within nursing and, and what, what does it mean that a nurse is a professionalized body? And she said that, you know, what, what it means to her patients, she thinks, is that, um, that they can trust that that nurse or a physician or whomever has a body of knowledge that, that they can rely on, that they have been educated in a certain way that, that gives a sense of consistency across practitioners. Now, maybe that's aspirational. The, the, the professionalism has not eradicated racism in nursing or, or medicine or other professions. But can we say the same of bioethics? Can we say that the public, when they even know that we're involved in the discourse, trusts our role and trusts the expertise that we bring to the table and that we have inc incorporated and are aware of their voices, their ways of knowing and their values. Um, so to do that, we need to fundamentally res reshape 
the way we look at bioethics pedagogy. We need to shape, reshape the way that we look at, at things like bioethics fellowships, um, the programs that we use to, 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 to educate people that, that are training in bioethics. It needs to be more than a sprinkling of seasoning or, or you know, um, sprinkles on a cake. We need to change the recipe. Um, so this is an article that was written by Phoebe Friesen uh, in Impact Ethics. Uh, it, it's an important one. She, she, uh, so this is uh, following um, Joyce's death. Uh, she wrote this, this article and said, rather than asking for trust, we must trust those who say that their trust in medicine and law enforcement has been profoundly broken. And we must recognize that such a break is justified. Then we must work towards creating institutions that are worthy of trust. Of course, many are working towards this goal on a daily basis, both at the individual and systemic levels. But as Joyce's death makes clear, we need to do much more. Amen. I, I believe that um, my critique is that this was an article that was aimed at the healthcare system. I agree with that. We need to move that balloon to be part of this picture. Bioethics as a practice is a part of the healthcare system. And as such, we own the duty to eradicate structural racism, anti-Black, anti-Indigenous anti racism. You know, we, we, are, we have a part of this um, and not just as it impacts our colleagues in healthcare, or um, uh, the, the, the patients that, that we serve ultimately, but also our colleagues within this profession. Last slide, I promise, and then we'll have some, some time hopefully to, to go through this. This was a hard talk. This was a hard talk for us. Claudia and I have had lots of anxiety about this. Uh, we've been texting each other about this. Um, and, and so just imagine that this is a picture that both of those individuals are, are, are bioethicists. Right, uh, we stand for issues. I think together we stand for similar values. Um, you, we, we have worked together at, at similar tables on this issue and on others where race factors in heavily. The stakes are higher for for some of our members of our community and certainly for some of our patients and healthcare providers as well. So uh, what we need to what we need to think about is when we take the time to deliberate, we have to acknowledge who has the privilege to take that time and not face the consequences of this. Think about it this way. Um, I think that when we, uh, that, that, that we're, we're very skillful and we've jumped into the, the dialogue around resource allocation, right? Or priority setting. Um, we, we've talked about when we prioritize one group over another, what are the harms that, that could be there to, uh, to that those that, that are not prioritized at the front will face. Think about that for, for this context. If we don't see, uh, if, if we're not moving bio, uh, the race to the forefront of our conversation, what does it say to our racialized members of our community or the communities that we serve? Does it show them that we are not prioritizing this? Is our silence and moments of deliberation, our avoidance of this issue, is it, is it because we want to get things right or is the silence violence as one of my colleagues has, has said? So we'll leave that slide up and, and hopefully we've given a bit of time for questions. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Kevin and Claudia, for a thoughtful presentation. Um, so as the audience probably knows, it's time for question and discussions via the YouTube chat. If you aren't logged into YouTube and you do want to send in a question anonymously, um, please send an email to Lori Bolchak, and I believe her email has been put in the discussion on YouTube. So we do have a number of questions. For any that we don't get to, we will ensure that the presenters do receive them. So the first is just a comment from Sylvie LeMay saying, no, it isn't enough. I imagine, no, we're not doing enough. Thank you for speaking. Um, an additional question came in via email, so it's anonymous. And the question is, do you think it would be a good idea to set up at the institutional level committees made up of people from culturally diverse backgrounds with the goal of preventing racism by integrating ethical considerations related to racism into the training of health professionals. And this also, this kind of question came up as well from Bob Park, who asked whether we can proactively reach out maybe to individuals to join the bioethics community. Um, so slightly different, but I'll leave it to you. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Um, Claudia, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take the first stab at this one. Um, yeah, so so I I would agree that 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 is a good aspiration. Um, I I'll acknowledge that 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 some work is going on um, at, at various hospitals to set up these sorts of councils and, and committees. Um, 
you know, one could ask uh, in all of those institutions is bioethics at the table and it's not always the case. Um, should we be that, uh, I think we do have a role there. Um, but I, I guess, so I, while I agree with that, the cautionary tale is this, um, very often um, when we talk about engaging the voices of our community, we can tend to fall into the trap of doing that in a tokenistic manner, right? So, so bringing the voices to the table is not enough if you're going to have to if you're going to throw the burden on those people to speak truth to power without actually empowering those voices. So it, it is more about a fundamental shift in hiring practices, a shift in organizations. Many organizations after the death of George Floyd have put out statements. They've started committees um, that, that that look like they're doing the right things um, and may eventually do that. But you know, you'll have to excuse our cynicism because we've seen that um, when you've got engagement, it can sometimes lead towards this tokenistic idea that, well, we have talked to these these groups and we've incorporated that into what we're doing when in fact we haven't done that, that work all that well. So th there needs to be a lot of work to actually build trust for, for the purposes of this talk, we need to do that absolutely in, in bioethics. Um, one thing I don't know if we stressed enough is that um, as a field and as we move towards professionalization, we have to acknowledge that we are accountable to a public, whether we like that or not. The, what we say, um, it, it, it has a consequence for a public, some of whom are, 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 are very, I don't like this term, but, but, but very vulnerable structurally. Um, so we, we, can't, we can't float around and, and pretend that what we say has no impact because we give recommendations and don't make the final decision. Anyways, I, I, I answered maybe more than what that question was asking. I'm not sure, Claudia, if, if you want to jump in or... I don't think there is anything further to add to what you've just said. Thank you for the response. So I will um, read out the conclu conclusion remarks at five o'clock. So we have time for another question. Um, a comment was as well posed by Jennifer Gibson, just saying thank you, Claudia and Kevin, for this courageous and powerful talk. And another question was emailed, so it is anonymous. And this states, thank you for sharing your presentation. I would like to know the presenter's thoughts on the following. Bioethical silence, this is in quotations, was spoken about with respect to many different aspects of race and racism in Canadian and American society in the field of bioethics. It was stated that silence means there is a lack of a unified voice. Could it actually signal the opposite, at least in respect to some of the aspects of race and racism discussed? Many of the bioethical issues racism was contrasted with are those for which there is live bioethical debate, such as MAID, the triage protocol, AI, etc. But wouldn't most agree that any example of racism in healthcare is an example of the failure to achieve the equality and non-discrimination that are enshrined in Canadian law. I wonder if the silence actually signals a unified view. Hmm. I, I, I'll have to think about that. Um, I wish that I'd, I'd have my, I had the Google Doc up to so I could I could unpack that a little bit. Um, and I wish we were in a room where I could have a follow-up question with, with the speaker. Claudia, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts. I'll, I'll, I'll try and gather some thoughts for that, but um, sure. I don't know. The question's been posted just in um, Zoom for your, so you oh. can see it if you would oh. like. Just give me one sec. I know we're running the clock here. Uh, how do I even get to the chat? You know what, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a sec. Um, sorry. No, no problem. I, I, so, you know, I'm going to take a stab at it because I can't find it at the moment, but I will, I guess what, what, what I'd say, um, and, and I might be completely misinterpreting this question, um, but our, so perhaps I erred in saying that silence is a lack of, of a unified voice when, uh, oh, sorry, here we go. So, um, so, could, uh, so it was stated that silence means that there's a lack of unified voice. Could it actually signal the opposite? In, 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 at least in respect to uh, some aspects of uh, race and racism discussed, many of bioethical issues um, uh, have a lively debate, but it wouldn't most agree that any example of racism in healthcare is an example of the failure to achieve the uh, equality and non-discrimination that were enshrined, that are enshrined in Canadian law. I wonder if the silence actually signals a unified view. Um, to that, I, I, I'd kind of say that, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. 
that racism is enshrined and is part of the structures within Canadian law, within all of our institutions. But um, I don't know that silence means a unified view for the right reasons or for the way that, that the question might be saying it. Because to the communities that are impacted by this, the lack of a bioethics voice, whether, we're not, whether or not we're deliberating about this or talking about this behind closed doors, means we are not engaging this. Um, you know, you see many people on, on Med Twitter, for example, saying racism is a thing in Canada. Racism is real in Canada. It might feel like that is a self-evident thing, but it needs to be said, right? Um, so any silence with regard to this issue is going down the wrong pathway, in my opinion. And, and if uh, the only unified voice it shows is a disengagement with the issue, in my opinion. I don't know, Claudia, if you, uh, but I, 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 I just want to be sensitive that I could be misinterpreting that question. The nerves are factoring in. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think the only thing that I would add is just that it doesn't quite get at or it doesn't speak to the fact that at the end of the day, the way in which issues of race or wider sociocultural issues are dealt with, once again, comes back down to the way that it's sprinkled on, right? It's not any, any form of meaningful, deep engagement. So in the absence of this kind of deep engagement, as well as silence, what, how, how, how is that to be interpreted by the different communities that we serve? Yeah, and, and, and do, we even, do we even care to hear that, right? That, that's that, and I, I think yes is the answer, but what steps have we taken to hear those criticisms, right? That, that's something we need to ask ourselves. Thank you so much, Kevin and Claudia. So there are a number of additional thoughts and questions that have been emailed and posted. So we will pass these along and anyone else who does have additional comments or questions, please feel free to forward them to Lori. Um, unfortunately, it is time to draw today's lecture to a close. I'll make a couple of announcements before we thank our speakers. So our final seminar of 2020 is next week on Wednesday, December 2nd where Alison Thompson will be discussing COVID-19 vaccine ethics, creating a climate of trust. To sign up to receive the weekly seminar reminder emails, please email jcb.info at utoronto.ca. And CSB students who are enrolled in the CSB student seminar course, please remember to keep track of your attendance. Claudia and Kevin, on behalf of all of us, I just want to sincerely thank you for an informative, thought-provoking, and very necessary presentation. So thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Andrea.